It's a pleasure this morning to have with us James J. Ackerman, the president and CEO of Prison Fellowship, an organization uh, familiar to many of us that works to restore America's criminal justice system and those that it affects. Uh, they help men and women replace uh, the cycle of brokenness that landed them in prison with an alternative for their lives. They advocate for justice reform and activate grassroots networks to do the same thing. They equip wardens to bring restorative change to their facilities. They care for prisoners' families and help strengthen the bond between children and their parents who are behind bars. They call the church to lead the way in caring for those impacted by the criminal justice system. And they do it all from a biblical worldview. James formally joined Prison Fellowship in 2016 as president and CEO. He has more than 20 years of experience as a highly effective executive with several media companies. He's also a veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard, and he served on the board of several companies and nonprofit organizations, including Saving Innocence, which provides social services to underage girls rescued from sex trafficking, uh, the International Documentary Association, and the Stockholm-based, and I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, Asado, uh, a global pioneer in video applications. Prior to joining Prison Fellowship, James was has heavily engaged in a variety of voluntary capacities in uh, prison ministries. And we're uh, looking forward to hearing uh, your story, James, and uh, more about uh, your perspective on things as the leader of Prison Fellowship. But right now, I just want to say to you, welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here and uh, and enjoying, uh, as we were discussing beforehand, enjoying being in your library here. Uh, it's very well stocked. Uh, it's uh, very impressive. Um, well, James, uh, it, in reading just a little bit about you and uh, wanting to get you know to know you better, um, you have uh, your bi your biography. I'm imagining is maybe more described as a journey or a pilgrimage. So how did you come to faith? Um, and how did that lead you to involvement in prison ministry? Share that with us, would you? Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. So uh, when I was in the Coast Guard, um, I, uh, in, I, I originally was on a search and rescue team in Key West, Florida, and then transferred to Governor's Island, which is uh, at the time was a uh, United States Coast Guard base. Governor's Island's in the middle of New York Harbor, right at, right across from the Statue of Liberty, actually. And um, uh, a barracks mate of mine um, uh, invited me to go to church with him one day. I had been contemplating for a while um, matters of faith, mainly influenced mainly by him, because I, I saw that he had committed his life to Jesus. And I was curious about that. Um, and I came to the conclusion during my journey that, that if God is real, then by definition, God must have a purpose and plan for my life. And if God isn't real, then I really don't want anybody telling me how to live. And, and so Clay invited me to go to church with him. And his church was Calvary Baptist Church in New York City on West 57th Street. And uh, long story short, um, I went for three consecutive Sundays. And on the third Sunday, they were interviewing for a new, new senior pastor. And he gave a, you know, wind up pitch, come to Jesus uh, uh, altar call. And I responded. We were sitting up in the balcony. I popped up walked down the stairs and came to the front of the church and committed my life to Jesus. Now, I'd been raised in the Episcopal Church. I went to All Saints Episcopal Church in Beverly Hills, but I never really understood the concept of being in a relationship with Jesus. And so that was that was new for me. And um, and that began my, my, my faith journey. Um, I would later in New York City uh, meet my wife, uh, Martha, of, of we're about to celebrate 31 years of marriage. Uh, she's here with me today. Uh, and <clears throat> we would have our babies, Holden and Lily, and begin our journey of life. Well, actually, that sounds really familiar. I grew up in the Episcopal Church. Uh, mm -hmm. I was an acolyte. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> and, and, and then when in young life, they explained that the purpose of Jesus was to put you into relationship with God. It's like, oh, well, somehow I didn't pick this up. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. And 
boy, our lives uh, are, are not the same after that, are they? <laughs> no, not at all. Not so at, all. at some point along the line, though, uh, when, when did prison ministry uh, come into uh, focus for you? And, and what led you to, uh, to get involved in that? And, and what are some of the experiences that you've had as a volunteer? Yeah, so I, um, <clears throat> uh, I fast forward, we're now living in San Francisco. I'm the CEO of a public company called Open TV, which has since been sold and, and, and taken private. Um, and uh, I uh, was spending way too much time on the road. Um, we had customers in 50 countries, and I was constantly heading to an airport going someplace in the world. And Martha became very concerned, rightly, that I wasn't spending enough time with the family and with our children. And so she sent, and I mean sent, like packed my bag for me, sent our son and I, Holden, uh, on a father-son retreat uh, at a place called Mount Hermon, a Christian retreat center in the Santa Cruz Mountains. You've probably been there. Yeah. And, uh, um, and uh, for this wonderful father-son retreat, it was great. And I'm a big believer in divine appointments. I actually pray for them. Um, and uh, as God would have it, our cabin mates were a guy named Dick Paulson and his son, Jeff. And Dick was the development director for Prison Fellowship on the West Coast. And he told me more about Chuck Holson. I knew a little bit about Chuck and the work of Prison Fellowship. And then he invited me to go visit a prison, to see a Prison Fellowship Academy uh, uh, with him. And I agreed and did. And we went and visited that prison. And I'm telling you, I've never had an experience like this before or since. I walked into that prison and I felt like I was at home. At home? I felt like I belonged there. Wow. I, w I didn't want to leave. If they had invited me to stay in a cell for the night, I would have done it. I just loved being there. I loved interacting with the men. Um, and God just did something in my heart. Now, I, I grew up in a pretty wealthy family. My parents were both in the television industry. My dad has a star in Hollywood Boulevard and the whole thing. We grew up in a house with a view of half of Los Angeles and in the hills. And I still don't understand how God took that kid and gave him a passion for being in the middle of a prison yard. But it happened. So it sounds like it was uh, even more sudden than, um, than you're coming to Christ. Uh, like that. Yeah. Um, here's the crazy thing. So I get back home and I said, said to Martha, I said, I have got to get involved in prison ministry. And she's like, this is not why I sent you on a father son retreat. <laughs> so you can take on yet another thing. But <clears throat> in our community group that met at our friend's house in San Francisco, and believe me, to be a follower of Jesus in San Francisco, you've got to be like really serious about it, right? Nobody like pretends, right, in San Francisco. So we're in our community group with at our a friend's house, who's just three, four blocks away from us. And a woman says, literally, she says, you know, I've got a friend who's been counseling a guy on death row in San Quentin, uh, who a guy who came to Jesus during his trial, and he, he just can't afford the time anymore. And he's looking for somebody who'll take his place. I'm like, I'll do it. So I started counseling a guy who murdered six people in one night. And as I mentioned, came to know the Lord during the course of his trial. And he just needed somebody to talk to, to walk through the Bible together. And so I started doing that. And that's what took me on the road to becoming a, uh, a volunteer with Prison Fellowship. So uh, with, with him or with others that you've had relationships with, um, what are some things that have impacted you about their lives and compared to your life and um, their journeys as compared to your journey? As the French would say, le même chose. It's the same thing. Same thing. How and, so? You know, it, 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 I've made tremendous mistakes in my life. So have they. Mm. I've had great hopes in my life. So do they. I've had victories in my life. So have they. And they are people, right? They're part of our community. They are part of our family. And those who are followers of Jesus are part of the church, capital C. And so, um, you know, they're in a place where they need to be for a season. 
um, to be held accountable for what they did. Um, and hopefully their sentence is proportionate to what they did and not uh, uh, unnecessarily punitive. Um, but uh, these are people. And that's the thing I discovered on the day. I'm, I'm hanging out with guys who are no different than me. The one guy I met was was a, a young man. I mean, he, he could be like any one of our sons, clearly articulate and bright. He was the foreman for a residential construction company. His name is Chad. Um, and he uh, took the guys out for beers after the completion of a project and had a couple too many and was driving his pickup truck home and didn't pay attention to the 12 year old girl walking through the intersection and his truck hit her and sent her to, to heaven. And he was serving a five or seven year, I don't recall exactly, sentence for vehicular homicide. And he said to me, tears streaming down his face. He said to me, I know Jesus has forgiven me. The parents of the girl have forgiven me and let me know. The owner of the construction company has forgiven me and told me I have my job back as long as I stay clean and sober when I get out. He goes, but I am struggling to forgive myself. Well, that is a very human thing. Who can't relate to that? Who hasn't done something really stupid in their life that comes back to haunt their mind and go, ah, you know, and we all have that experience. And so his experience, you know, resulted in the death of a 12 year old and landed him in prison. But my embarrassing moments uh, may not have landed me in prison, but there's still things that I have to wrestle with and deal with. Wow. So you were in the Coast Guard and then you sort of followed in the footsteps uh, of the family business, if, if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and then uh, you got involved in uh, the life of faith and prison ministry, and that just became huge for you. Um, but the logical step after that is maybe not to become the president and CEO of Prison Fellowship, and yet that's how God led you. Uh, Share with us a little bit about that part of, uh, of your life. So, yeah, Martha and I both became volunteers of Prison Fellowship. Me in prison, Martha through Angel Tree. Um, and then I, uh, we also became donors to Prison Fellowship over that period. Um, and uh, I met Chuck Holson, spent a meaningful amount of time with him. I consider him, him a mentor in my life. Uh, uh, but fast forward, uh, in 2015, I was the executive chairman of a me media technology company called Broadway Systems that provided a software solution that cable TV networks used. And um, we sold it to a global competitor. And uh, so literally on the day the transaction closed, I was done. You know, they didn't need me anymore. And uh, so I'm, uh, you know, going through my discernment process of figuring out, okay, Lord, what, what, what do you have next for me? And I learned that my predecessor at Prison Fellowship had left. And so I said to Martha, I said, do you mind if I throw my hat in the ring? I said, I doubt I'm what they're looking for. I'm probably too aggressive, to be honest, uh, for what they want, but I don't see, you know, the harm. And we prayed about it and she said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And so um, I went through the process of being interviewed uh, by their board over many months. I mean, it was a seven month long process. Um, and uh, in the end, they invited me to become uh, the CEO of Prison Fellowship. And uh, I, 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 you know, <laughs> I absolutely love it. I, I I can't tell you how much I love it. I mean, it, it is a it is a real um, joy to be able to lead an organization that's at the core of my personal passion. So so fun. So one of the aspects of prison fellowship that we particularly want to look at today is uh, the whole issue of racial inequity in the prison system yep. and. Uh, we have a video that yeah. that, that, that we're gonna that I'm gonna share, and so we're gonna uh, mute our microphones, turn our uh, cameras off, and watch. Yep, yeah. and let's remind. Oh, yep. Yeah.
Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, let's remind people that if you have questions for either of us, please put them in the Q&A. Black Americans make up only 13% of the United States population, yet make up 27% of total arrests, 33% of prisoners, and 38% of parolees. I was born into a family that was pretty poor, and my father was an alcoholic and very verbally and physically abusive person. And once I turned uh, 18 and graduated from high school, I ended up signing up for the Army. And I signed up for the Army not so much as so that I can be in the Army for the right purposes, but as an escape to get away from the physical and verbal abuse that I was suffering at home. So once I got out, I decided I was going to live my life any way I wanted to. So I started selling drugs and I sold drugs for nearly four years. Well, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, crack was prevalent on the scene. Cocaine, even though you utilize cocaine to make crack cocaine, cocaine was not really you know, being sold in the neighborhoods that I was in, which were the projects and the communities of color. I committed wrong, a wrong act, and I should really have been and was held accountable for my wrong act. It wasn't until later on that I found out that there was a distinguishing factor between powder cocaine and crack cocaine, not in the utilization of it, but in the sentencing for it, phase for it. After the fact, because of the biasness or racial discrimination in the sentencing scheme, the crime bill that was done in 1994, I fell in 95 a year after its passage, so therefore I was subject to higher penalties. I received 21 additional years because of the racial indifference between the two drug types and the areas that these drugs were sold in. I would say that the racial inequity that I noticed at Sennison followed me into prison because once I got to prison, I was able to see several other people from many different states that had sentences the same as mine or greater than mine, even life sentences. So just me being able to witness on the compound itself, the spare charges and, and sentences for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine or for other different offenses, how it kind of changed the uh, momentum of things, I would say it caused a lot of violence and tension on the institution itself. I got released in 2016, and then because of the prosecutor appealing my sentence, I went back and ended up being released January 3rd, 2019. Now mind you, had it not been for the first step back, I still would be incarcerated today. Every person is made in the image of God. It's time for the church in America to lead on advancing racial justice. Wow. Um, that's powerful. So two things were mentioned, um, the Fair Sentencing Act and the First Step Act. Yeah. Uh, say a little bit about that and other um, legal uh, dynamics and legisl legislative steps that um, um, are in the works or have been taken to address some of these I, I don't have another word other than um, systemic, I guess. Uh, I mean, they're just in the, they're in the criminal justice code, right? So that's, um, it's not up to individual uh, 
people. Um, it, it just happens across the board, it seems. Right. As Matthew said, in the uh, up until the Fair Sentencing Act, the disparity between um, the punishment for crack cocaine and powder cocaine was 100 to 1. Now, imagine you're in New York City. Do you think, how often do you think a woman having lunch at, say, the Peninsula Hotel, uh, walking out with her Birkin bag, and inside her Birkin bag is a half kilo of powder cocaine. How often do you think she's going to get stopped and frisked? Never. And how often is the kid up in Harlem with the baggy jeans uh, and, uh, and three rocks of crack cocaine in his pocket going to get stopped and frisked? Yeah. Every day. And that's what happens. And that's the problem. And so um, the idea and, you know, research has shown there is no chemical difference between or addictive difference between crack cocaine and power cocaine. It's a total lie. And so the idea that you would get a far greater sentence because you had crack cocaine versus power cocaine is a nonsense. And the likelihood that you're going to get arrested in communities of poverty and color um, for crack cocaine versus affluent communities using powder cocaine is far more likely. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the we were intimately involved in the First Step Act. I mean, intimately involved. Prison Fellowship has a very effective public policy uh, and advocacy team. Half of them are lawyers. Um, and we sat at the table with the co-authors, the original co-authors of the First Step Act, Hakeem Jeffries and Doug Collins. Uh, Hakeem Jeffries is a congressman from New York. Doug Collins uh, was congressman from Georgia. Um, in the White House with uh, Jared Kushner, uh, he really drove this uh, on the White House side. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it was a lot of work to get, you know, the association of, uh, you know, American Association of Sheriffs and prosecutors and all of these people on board with what they would accept. And the, well, in you know, a nutshell, what is the First Step Act? Does two things, basically, in, in a nutshell. It provides greater programming into the federal system, um, and including faith-based programming, and, um, and it had moderate sentencing reforms, uh, which um, uh, when the when the when the um, uh, fair fair sentencing act was put into place, it wasn't retroactive; it was only forward looking. And so, people like Matthew Charles, who had been sentenced before that, uh, were stuck. And so, what the First Step Act is, it corrected that and made it retroactive, which a lot. President Trump signed into law in December 2018, and Matthew Charles was out of prison in January. Wow! Uh, I mean, you know, in two or three weeks. Uh, because it basically said, okay, your sentence is done. Well, that's okay. Um, so there, there are some other aspects of, of the systemic nature and things that, that you're uh, aware of that, that you face, that Prison Fellowship faces regularly. Uh, tell us a little bit more about those. Well, the uh, in the 1980s and 90s, most politicians on both sides of the aisle, I mean, Bill Clinton would be the first to admit he did the same thing. Most politicians came to office by being tough on crime. Lock them up and throw away the key, you know, do the crime, do the time. And, you know, uh, and so what happened is America became, you know, the industrial complex of prison construction. I mean, it was crazy. And, you know, we have 2.1 million people locked up in this country. We, we, we lock up more people per capita and in real numbers than any other country in the world. It's crazy. Um, and so, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, as, as, as mentioned in the opening stats of that video, um, people of color, particularly African-Americans, are disproportionately represented. They're arrested more often. They're less often offered plea deals. Um, they um, usually can't afford their own counsel. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, they end up getting, you know, uh, disproportionately, re are disproportionately represented in our prisons. 13% uh, of our citizenry is African-American, but 33% of our prison population is Black. So 
Um, that's a problem. And uh, but the good news is, you know, folks are beginning to realize it. And, you know, the crazy thing about the, the First Step Act is that 80 percent of members of the House and 80 percent of members of the Senate actually voted in favor for it. It was the most bipartisan thing that has happened that I can think of in the last five years or more. Yeah. Uh, and that is happening at the state level as well. Uh, I was with Pew Charitable Chess Trust with their the head of their uh, uh, um, cr uh, 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 criminal reform division. And I said, what state is, this is when I first came on board. I said, what state is like, like the most, you know, innovative, the most, you know, progressive in terms of change. And he says, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe what I'm about to say, but it's Texas. Texas has implemented a complete re-architecture of their criminal justice system using drug courts and things like that, ma making people go to mandatory rehab instead of just throwing them in prison because they've been found with drugs and this and that. Um, allowing mothers who are first time uh, convicted for the first time for a drug offense to, uh, you know, raise their babies at home on an ankle brace as, as long as they, um, you know, pass, you know, regular testing and, uh, and stay completely clean and sober. Um, and so what's happened is since 2008, Texas has closed 10 prisons. So they've seen their, uh, and this is pre-pandemic, so... Um, but they've seen their prison population fall, recidivism has fallen in Texas, and they're enjoying their lowest crime rate. This again was pre-pandemic, this may be different now, but their lowest crime rate since um, 1968. So um, many people will be aware of this, but for those uh, who, um, who may not be thinking about prisons all the time, there are state uh, prisons, and then there are fe federal uh, prisons. And um, so federal laws affect fe federal prisons, but but how how does what's done uh, at the federal level uh, impact the states? It, 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 it's a very good question. So the um, in many respects, <clears throat> what Texas implemented um, was very influential on the First Step Act. And the First Step Act encouraged a lot of states like Georgia and others to begin introducing their own versions of the First Step Act. So it's actually had a lot of influence. There are two, two ways that, that legislators come to this problem, to be frank. One is the human side, which is this just isn't right. We can't do this to our citizens. Um, uh, to be frank, that tends to be more how uh, uh, most Democrats will approach the issue. And the other is fiscal, which is how more Republicans approach the issue. We just can't afford this. We can't afford to keep this many people locked up, and we can't afford to build more prisons. That's the thing that Texas faced in 2008. The downturn happened, and they were on, on track to build three more prisons. So we can't do this. We can't afford it. We've got to do something different. And so... Um, so that is a move, you know, we, Martha and I live in California and California has made an earnest effort to reduce its prison population, including reversing the life sentences that many people have received. Um, again, probably due to over sentencing, to be frank. Mm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so cha change is afoot. And the pandemic has actually helped because prisons have been looking to you know, lots of people. I mean, Michael Cohen is sitting in his apartment in New York City right now with an ankle bracelet on, finishing out his sentence um, because they wanted to reduce prison population to to create a greater sense of social distancing in the prison. So I imagine that a prison fellowship uh, is really focused on changing the system as it is rather than dwelling on, well, how did we get to the place where uh, the charge for crack cocaine was so disproportionate to the charge for powder cocaine. Um, and yet, um, there are some things like uh, the, the likelihood of uh, a person who's uh, marginalized, a person of color, um, being stopped and frisked uh, at, at a higher rate. And, and so, what are some things that you see that need to change uh, downstream from 
from from the the, the laws, uh, the the penal codes and the the, the prison uh, guidelines and things like that. We we have been asked, and I have agreed um, to counsel um, various organizations and 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 legislators, both federal and state, on policing reform um, because we um we 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 witness and experience the relationship between corrections officers and incarcerated and that largely informs our perspective on uh on on policing and so the the question that we wrestle with is what is the role of a police force right what's their function um is it to find people who are committing crimes and and get them in prison? Uh, is it to maintain the peace? Is it to be engaged with the community? Uh, you know, or is it kind of all of the above? Um, and so, uh, you know, um, so we are, we are beginning to counsel more than anything else. I'm not quite sure we're going to, you know, suggest language in, in, in particular bills or whatever, but counsel based on our experience on what we see, because when you have a healthy culture uh, within a prison where the corrections officers treat the men or women in a particular prison with with basic human dignity and respect you end up with a healthier culture you end up with less violent offenses taking place less battles and fights taking place uh less um talking back at the corrections officers and all of this um and, and and again, that that informs our perspective on what is the role of a police force in a, in any particular community. Yeah, um, some months ago, I watched a, an interview between Tim Keller in New York City, the pastor of Redeemer, former pastor, yeah. and Brian Stevenson. Yeah. And um, I think Brian Stevenson, in talking about uh, police forces and, and the police, said we train police. Um, to be warriors and we need them to be shepherds or something like that. Um, and so uh, you you give uh, counsel to, to prisons and I don't know if you work with police forces, are there, um, and, and police reform is, is a huge conversation now and it's a politically um, volatile conversation. Do you have any perspective on the need for police reform from where you sit and, and yeah i think i think we need to define what's the role of a police force and i i would ag agree with brian stevenson that <clears throat> a police force is there to maintain to, to be engaged in the community they should be part of the community um, to maintain peace and order and um and yes and to uh to uh, uh you know uh, 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 take those who are committing crimes off the street. So they, they have an important role to play and a tough role to play, but we need, um, we need our police officers to be part of our community. And we need, we as citizens need to treat our police officers as part of our community and not our enemy. Um, and, you know, I, uh, um, we, we don't agree with this, you know, defund police, da, 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 you know, narrative. Uh, but we do agree that more officers need to live in the communities that they're serving, okay. right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we think officers should be closer to the communities they serve. Uh, we think officers should lead with, uh, with being engaged in their community, uh, learning, f finding ways to build trust, particularly with children, so that they, you know, when they come of a certain age, they don't see the police officer as their enemy, but as their, as a member of their community. Um, and we need to be careful about turning our police forces into, you know, armies, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a number of things there, but, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, let, let's uh, turn to some of the Q&A. And there are two uh, questions about the First Step Act, um, or at least related to it. Um, so how effective in terms of statistics has the, the First Step Act been? Um, do, do you have any any uh, data on that of before and after the First Step Act? So the First Step Act yeah. resulted in about 3,000 people having their sentences commuted 
uh, as a result, including Matthew Charles, uh, who I've gotten to know uh, quite well since he got out of prison. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, the wheels of justice turn slowly. The Bureau of Prison has been very slow to adopt um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, elements of the First Step Act, particularly introducing more programming and faith-based programming. And we're actually dealing with that right now. Um, we've sent them a very, to put it lightly, a very stern letter, um, uh, basically rebuking the Bureau of Prisons for their failure to do the things that were expected in the First Step Act. So the sentencing piece, they had no choice, right? They just have to follow the law. But the programming piece, they've been very, very, very slow. And the fundamental problem at the Bureau of Prisons is they run their own programming, some of which may be effective, some of which may not, but they they grow their budget each year by introducing more programming of their own and then say, we need more appropriations to fund this programming. They don't really want other people's programming. And they certainly don't want other people's programming that would be offered completely free of charge, like the Prison Fellowship Academy. There's 113 Prison Fellowship Academies in 30 states today, and um, we don't have one of them in a federal prison anywhere. Um, so that's uh, commuting sentences. Did it have any impact on sentencing? Yeah, I mean, it... it, it um, it had some mild changes in sentencing for drug, nonviolent drug related crimes. Um, when the White House, uh, when the original bill had more in the way of sentencing reform, but the, um, the more conservative Republicans in the Senate in particular just weren't having it and they were just going to go against it. And so they had to kind of dial it back a little bit um, to get enough of the Republican senators on board. The White House was very concerned that it could pass with in the Senate with Democrats and a few moderate Republicans, and that would get it to pass, but it wouldn't feel like a Republican victory. So the White House wanted it dialed back a bit, and they, and they prevailed in that. So, um, uh, so there's mild sentencing reform for nonviolent drug offenses, including uh, um, the, the, the retroactive treatment of the uh, pieces that were in the Fair Sentencing Act. You said you told your wife that you weren't sure you were going to get the job because you pushed too hard. Um, <laughs> it, 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 sounds, uh, it sounds like, though, it, it's that, that your aggressiveness is, uh, is a, an advantage here for, for those uh, who your work affects. So first step. Um, What's about, is there a second and a third step? That's what one of the questions is. I mean, it sort of presupposes that there might be, but what would you say those are? Yeah, so we, um, as, uh, as I think you may have gleaned, we try to operate on a bipartisan basis. Probably our strongest relationships are on the Republican side of the aisle, but we do work with, with um, on both sides of the aisle. So <clears throat> we actually were able to um, be briefed by the Biden transition team um, before the inauguration, uh, that one of the things that was going to be a priority for them was to um, end the disparity between crack and powder cocaine. And so there is an, a, a, a bill uh, that has been drafted. I can't remember who the authors of it are, so forgive me for that. Um, <clears throat> and it's called the Equal Act not to be mistaken for the Equality Act, which is something completely different. But the Equal Act is to make one-to-one -one, the punishment for crack cocaine and powder cocaine to be exactly the same. So that's uh, that's a priority and that is that has some momentum and hopefully before too long will uh, hit the floor and pass and find its way to President Biden's desk. Um, there is the, the ambition um, for a second step act, if you will, is really around uh, sentencing reform. And <clears throat> so a lot of offenses in the federal system are, have mandatory minimums. We, for, I mean, w with some exceptions, we don't favor this for the most part. And the reason is, is it takes away from the jurist, it takes away from the judge, the opportunity 
to discern where is this person? Is this person repentant for what they did? Are they truly sorry for what has happened and, and have already begun to make amends in their life to, uh, to ensure that this thing doesn't happen again? Or are they just a total donkey and are completely unrepentant and given the chance to do exactly the same thing again and again and again. Um, and so, and to judge that, okay, this one needs a lesser sentence because he's already making the effort and this one needs to go down for a while. He doesn't have that choice. Right. And so particularly on the lower side, you know, to say, um, unfortunately I've got to sentence you to X even though I'd prefer to have, have to sentence you to Y because of the mandatory minimums. So sentencing reform will largely be around um, that, which is putting more things into the hands of the judge and not to be legislated by Congress, uh, the, the exact sentence. Um, so on a different note, there's a question about uh, drug and alcohol rehabilitation while in prison. Yeah. Uh, what programs are there? Uh, are they effective? Uh, and is there a difference between faith-based programs and, uh, and those that are not? Yeah, absolutely. So we, <clears throat> we partner with Celebrate Recovery uh, in prison. And so um, in all 113 academies, um, uh, that we have in the country. The closest one to where we're sitting right now is St. Bride's. And I think your own David Remnick, Remnick has been with us to St. Bride's. Um, uh, and um, St. Uh, prison Fellowship Academy in, Ch in a prison in Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, and uh, so we, we partner with Celebrate Recovery. Everyone who goes through the academy goes through Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is a gospel-centric 12-step program. We believe the gospel has to be part of it. We believe that Jesus can transform our lives if we allow him to do so. And so not having a sort of higher force kind of thing as you would, would in AA, and I'm not dissing AA. I mean, for those in your congregation who go to regular AA meetings, that's great and, and would encourage you know those to continue to do so. But for us, um, having people encounter Jesus, and, you know, the 60% of men who are incarcerated have uh, drugs or alcohol addiction as part of their narrative. And over 80% of women who are incarcerated um, have drugs or alcohol addiction. And so it's a real issue uh, that people need to grapple with. And often just the grappling with that ends their life uh, as a criminal. So Jesus is the higher power. Um, Jesus is the higher power. Well, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Jesus is the only power. Yeah. Um, so here's a question about uh, the current situation in prisons. This, uh, this person did some prison work, a volunteer in the Seven Locks Jail, which is close by here. Seven Locks is just north uh, of Bethesda. Um, mm -hmm. And he said it was a good experience. He said it was similar to yours. And he asked, nowadays, how safe are prisons for inmates? Uh, you know, that, <clears throat> you know, there's no way to answer that because it depends on the, on the prison. But I'll give you an example. So um, I often ask legislators, it's all about safer communities, right? Yeah. Okay. So we need to make our prisons more restorative in nature because in our experience, if a prison is left to its own, or if a prison, prison is particularly punitive in nature, it actually becomes a boot camp of criminality. You end up with people going to prison who come out of prison better criminals and tougher. Um, so we need our prisons to be centers of restoration. So let me give you an example. So we had a staff member who just recently retired named Fred, who went to prison when he was 21 years old and in California for something that's not even a crime anymore, marijuana possession. And he was sentenced to San Quentin. He was sent to San Quentin. And he was like on a three-year sentence, you know. Um, but he was a young guy, and boys in particular like to be part of a tribe. 
And so he joined the Aryan Brotherhood and uh, became an enforcer for them and carried out a hit against a black gang, rival gang member, murdered the guy, and was sentenced to life in prison. Now, Fred, uh, I'll come back to Fred. Fred's not actually the point. The point is, is that San Quentin at the time was a total boot camp of criminality. It was controlled by the gangs. There was absolute chaos there. Everybody at war with one another, right, in the 1970s. Today, San Quentin is led by a warden named Ron Davis, who's a graduate of our warden exchange program. And it's absolutely a center of restoration. It is one of the most programmed prisons you'll ever visit. Uh, it's unbelievable. You want to get a college education? You can do so at San Quentin. You want to learn to write code through the last smile, uh, which is a, a program that teaches people, a Silicon, founded by Silicon Valley uh, um, um, entrepreneurs. You can learn to write JavaScript at San Quentin. Uh, of course, you can get your GED, but you can also learn to play guitar and play the piano. You, I mean, you can be in the Prison Fellowship Academy. There's a chapel for Catholics, a chapel for Protestants, a chapel, chapel for Jewish followers, a, a, a mosque for Muslims, all at San Quentin. It is no longer a yard that's controlled by gangs. It's just, it's a center of restoration. Believe me, if I had to go to prison in California, I'm going to be begging to go to San Quentin. So there's a uh, question from someone, anonymous question, um, regarding the purpose of prisons. And you've basically sort of tipped your hand that they should be restorative. Um, uh, he has a recollection that C.S. Lewis uh, argued that they, the prisons, the purpose of prisons are for punishment. I'm not aware of, uh, of Lewis saying that, but th that certainly is an argument. It strikes me, though, that um, isn't that what leads to uh, factories, the factories of criminality dynamic, if, if, uh, if prisons are, are, are really focused just on, on that kind of punishment? Or how, would you, how do you respond to, to the, the distinction? Well, so, um, uh, two two thoughts. I, I I'm not familiar with the C.S. Lewis quote, but the the statement that prison is going to prison is the punishment. The prison itself shouldn't be an additional punishment on top of it, right? The fact that I've been removed from society, I've had my liberty taken from me, is is punishment enough, right? And the amount of time that I have to be there is you know the punishment. Right. So but let's let's back up because the, these are people. So the vast majority of men in prison grew up in a household with no father or an unhealthy father figure. The vast majority of women in prison, I mean, greater than 80 percent of women in prison have suffered trauma, usually at the hands of a man. Right. Including being raped by fathers and stepfathers and, and what have you. Um, and the vast majority of them, as I mentioned, become addicts and that addiction is actually directly related to their criminal history. So she she may not be in prison because she had crack cocaine in her pocket. She may be in prison because she was stealing from somebody to fund her cocaine or crack addiction. Um, so when we look at it like that and we remember that these are people, then it isn't just like you're a bad boy and you need to go to prison and it needs to be a very hard time for you. We need to say, okay, when this guy was a young guy, there was nobody to coach him. I grew up in a household with a father and a mother. I had a father who set me right when I was getting off the trail, right? Um, when I was not doing, making the right choices. And he taught me what it meant to be a man. He taught me what it means to walk with integrity. He taught me to take responsibility for my actions. He taught me... Um, <clears throat> how to live life well. Um, but if you grow up in a household where the only, the only voices in your life are people on the street, the gang that you're running around with, then you're going to have a worldview that is so broken that's going to lead to very negative outcomes. So if you can come alongside people and say, one, I want to just let you know, because you're here on earth, I mean, not in this prison, it means that God has a purpose and plan for your life if you're willing to step into relationship with him through Christ Jesus. So that's the starting line. And then walking with people like we do through our academy to understand what it means to live life well, 
what it means to walk with integrity and responsibility and be in community with people that are different than you and all of those things. And the Academy is a year long intensive program that does just that. Right. And so if we look at people as people and say, let, let, let me help you pivot to in a new direction um, that, that is journeying through life in relationship with Jesus and then journeying through life in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a purposeful uh, manner, then, uh, then, the, then that, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to lead with love, right? There's no point in going into prison and saying, you're a bad boy, you committed a murder. He's in prison, right? He's already been punished. So let's lead with love and say, Jesus loves you for who you are and where you are today and wants to be in relationship with you right now. I love I love the way you describe that, and and the the reason is because um, human beings are are made in God's image, and um, and, because, and because of that, are, we're, we're redeemable. Um, but there's probably a fiscal argument too. I imagine that the restorative approach uh, is is more effective, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, it's got it's got to be harder and more expensive in the long run to run factories for criminality than uh, places like San Quentin has become. Right, so our oldest academy is in Texas. It's uh, outside of Houston, Texas. Personally started by Chuck Olson himself in 1997. <clears throat> the leader of that academy, the director of that academy is a guy named Daryl Brooks, who is a graduate of it. Went down on a 15 year sentence. I'm gonna share a video uh, at that will sh uh, illuminate some of this on a 15 year sentence. At, at the lunch and learn. At the lunch and learn, sorry, yep. and uh, and found he had <laughs> his roommate was a Christian and kept encouraging him to come with him to church in the prison, and uh, and eventually capitulated. He was like, "I just got to get this guy off my back, so I'll go." And he accepted Jesus into his life, and applied to go into the academy, graduated from the academy, got his college degree, came back as a volunteer, and ultimately. Uh, secured a position at the academy, rose the ranks, and is now the leader of it. Um, but the um, the state of Texas does every two years does a recidivism study for all of their major programs in the state, and there's like 21 or 26 what they consider major programs. And the Prison Fellowship Academy at the Carol Vance Unit is one of them. And uh, the most recent study. And the new one's probably being done as we speak. Uh, the most recent study, which came out in 2019, was the Prison Fellowship Academy was the number one recidivism reducer in the state. The number one, right? Um, and, you know, they studied people who had graduated from the academy and left prison in, in a particular year and looked at the recidivism rate over two years and over three years. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. I mean, it's off the charts. Like the state average is, is you know, around 40%. And for us, after three years, it was under 10%. And after two years, it was under 8%. Um, and so that tells you something. Yeah. Um, so here's another question that's asked anonymously. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit pointed. Um, looking at the downstream impacts of crack versus powdered cocaine, yeah. addiction, waste, violence, things like that. Um, are they similar uh, in terms of the, the, the two forms? Um, to, or uh, or are, are there differences in the downstream impacts of, of uh, cocaine use um, in those populations? And should there be, a, should the differences in penalty reflect uh, the different societal impacts. I suppose there's maybe a presupposition in this question that they they are different, but uh... and we would contend they're not. Okay, um, I, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to practice science without a license. But every study we've read <clears throat> is that the addiction qualities of powder cocaine and crack cocaine are equal. Now. Crack cocaine, because of its affordability, <clears throat> has been adopted as a drug of choice by 
more impoverished communities, particularly communities of color, whereas powder cocaine is the sort of um, the, you know, the sort of, you know, rock and roll drug of white affluent communities. And so, um, you know, there are other issues in in uh, in in impoverished communities that go beyond just drug addiction. Yes. Um, and we've mentioned some of them, you know, there are a lack of mentors and father figures who are raising their families right. And, you know, all kinds of other factors, uh, lack of education opportunities, employment opportunities, other things that make this very complex that relate to brokenness in some of those uh, in some of those communities. It's not exclusively true, but it's, you know, there it is broadly true. And so, um, but we don't we don't buy the narrative that you know there should be any disparity in in sentencing between these drugs. Um, we've had two more questions, I, and uh, I'm saving the best one for last. Okay. Uh, but controversy about public versus private uh, prisons. Um, what what do you what's your perspective? We're kind of up two minds about it. We have a great relationship with the two largest private prison organizations. Um, we, uh, in the last uh, 11 months, we've distributed over 115,000 Bibles into prison. When I came on board, Prison Fellowship was distributing five to 6,000 Bibles a year. But because of the pandemic, the demand for the Word of God has gone off the charts. And GEO, one of the private prisons, has been one of the biggest um, uh, 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 requests uh, biggest had the biggest request for if you i'm stumbling on my words uh for bibles you know we've we've given them like ten thousand bibles in the last year alone um <clears throat> so they really do care about their uh the people that they have in their care but the other side of it is a private prison is a business and who is the customer right well, the customer is actually the state, right? And, you know, so there can be a temptation uh, that, you know, the less services I provide, the, the less I spend, the more margin I create to run a profitable private business. And so, um, and that is very worrying because the, those who are impacted by that are the people in their care. And so, um, but I will tell you that in our experience, um, the suspicion that could be the case is actually less so than the reality. Um, but, uh, I, I, you know, I think the simple answer is we're, we're all in favor of a restorative approach to criminal justice. Um, <clears throat> and I'd rather be in a private prison in Oklahoma than any state prison in Alabama. Okay. Um, well, there, that would be, yeah. What I, one thinks of, uh, of Brian Stevenson's book and movie uh, about Alabama prisons. Um, so, mercy, yeah. yeah. So the, the last question, and it's a great question to uh, end on, um, what can the church do? And you mentioned the, the guy whose roommate took him uh, to church in the prison, but so, and then he went through the, the academy. So it, it's not just for inmates, the academy, or is it? Yeah, just for inmates. It's just, just for inmates. Oh, so his roommate was his cellmate. His cellmate, yeah, yeah. I yeah. got it. Okay. Um, well, what are some programs and things, though, that churches are doing to help yeah. prisoners in prisons? And, 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 you know, and when they're released. And, um, and then a, a follow up to that. Well, first, let's, let's look at that one. I guess the follow up is, um, are other faiths doing things like this? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so on the, the first part, um, I would encourage anyone uh, on this, uh, on this uh, webinar today to consider becoming a justice advocate. We have 30,000 justice advocates across the country. Um, by signing up, you'll receive a newsletter, a regular newsletter, uh, updating you on on public policy matters that we're working on. And when there is legislation, either in your state 
I, I presume your parishioners are coming from D.C., Maryland, Virginia, what have you. Um, <clears throat> when there is a uh, legislation in your state or at the federal level, we will invite you to send a letter via email that you can customize. Uh, you just put in your name and your zip code and we will list all your legislators that are relevant. Um, and you send that off saying, I support this, whatever this is, you know, Equal Act, for example. Um, so anybody can do that today, become a justice advocate. And how do you do that? Is there like a website to go to? to sign? Yeah, go, go to prisonfellowship.org uh -huh. and just go to our advocacy section and you can sign up to be a justice advocate. Okay. Um, and then the, you know, the other thing the church can do is <clears throat> in Washington, D.C., people are sentenced to a greater than one year, a sentence to greater than a year, go into the federal system. So there's not actually prisons in D.C. that we have programs going on. Uh, if you can get something started at the jail that you mentioned, we don't have anything, but if you can, I would certainly encourage that. Even just a Bible study going would be great. Um, the, uh, but one of the things you can do is invest in the lives of the children who uh, are in this town, who, uh, whose parents are incarcerated uh, by uh, adopting the Angel Tree program, which is a program whereby we, as volunteers, purchase and deliver Christmas gifts to the children of incarcerated on behalf of their moms and dads who have signed them up for it. Uh, but that's a, you know, that's a decision you'll have to take, Pastor. <laughs> All right. I'm going to put uh, what I think is the website to sign up to become a justice advocate. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, well, we're at the end of our time. And um, so... Uh, James, just want to thank you for being with us, but more than that, for uh, the work that you have really given your heart and soul to for many years, but particularly since you became the leader of uh, Prison Fellowship. And uh, as we close, I would like to pray for you and okay. for uh, your ministry. So Great. I invite folks to join. Let's pray. Awesome. Gracious God, uh, we thank you for all that we've learned this morning. We we thank you for the redemptive hope in, that we have in Jesus Christ and, um, and for the way that uh, Prison Fellowship and, and James uh, are, are making that uh, very tangible with their focus on restorative justice in our prison systems. Um, and Lord, would you, uh, would you bless that ministry and would you uh, provide James with wisdom and uh, courage and insight as uh, he perseveres in uh, the work that you have called him and Prison Fellowship to do. And Lord, as we are watching and as you might be stirring in our hearts, we pray that we might also have courage uh, to, uh, to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit if this is uh, what, what you would have for any of us. Um, and we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, as we pray in his name. Amen. Well, friends, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's been a wonderful morning, and I look forward to seeing you again uh, as soon as next week. Mm -hmm. um, goodbye, and God bless.